Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wellington's first ever standalone IHR night. My name is John Brown, upper school history and geography teacher, academic quiz team advisor, and the director of the humanities research program here at Wellington. And we've got a few stories to tell tonight. For weeks I've been talking about IHR night, and thanks again for coming. You're probably wondering what those initials mean. Before I turn the proceedings over to the scholars who have made this event necessary, allow me to explain. IHR stands for Independent Humanities Research. This is a program that has evolved quite a bit since I first took it over almost six years ago. What separates humanities research from other kinds of research? In the humanities, we use the past as a lens to the present and sometimes even the future. In humanities research, we observe the world around us and ask, why? How did this get to be this way? Who are those people in that photo? What happened to those people after this article was published? And on and on. Great, so what's the difference between IHR and other types of deep dive projects? So students are also encouraged and empowered to conduct their deep dive research in a wide variety of contexts. To mention just a few, I can remember students pursuing projects in American history, Russian literature, urban poverty, child psychology, political science, all things Disney, and advanced statistics, or at least it seemed like advanced statistics. Anyone who remembers Olivia White's legendary presentation from 2018 will agree with my assessment there. Students have pursued research material around the world, from Florida to France to Vietnam, where one student spent part of a trimester working in an orphanage as part of her humanities research project on solutions to global poverty. Independent research provides a forum for naturally inquisitive students to pursue their intellectual curiosity in ways that illuminate and enhance the baseline curriculum. Okay, so what then? We've identified a person, place, or phenomenon that requires something more than a Google search to satisfy our curiosity. And then we did. To understand more of the factors that contribute to any phenomenon than meet the eye requires serious introspection supported by existing literature and our own pointed questions. These scholars have developed an extensive knowledge of their subject area this year, and I encourage you to ask them about any aspect of their research during the QCCC and A sessions at the end of each of their presentations. Don't worry, I will explain what that means later as well. Sometimes, our initial curiosity and point of research leads to a preliminary conclusion and more research. Sometimes it leads us to identify a point of inflection, a place where we can interject ourselves into the conversation to bring about substantive change. And sometimes it leads us to a heightened understanding of that thing we barely knew about or questioned at the beginning of the research process, which we can then use to illuminate other similar phenomena in the world around us. Basically, the IHR project allows students to shape a passion project into a year-long research venture what makes this different from a year's worth of Google searches and YouTube rabbit trails is that the students themselves seek mentorship from experts in their field. Professors, professionals, thought leaders, content creators, and the like, who serve as gentle guides in the research process. This is the secret sauce of IHR research. Expert guidance makes it much easier to sort through the white noise and avoid the innumerable pitfalls of cold research. It's like climbing Mount Everest. You could do it on your own, and you will have an unforgettable experience if you try to go it alone, but why not get help from someone who knows the most efficient way to get to the top? By the way, if any of you are interested in becoming an IHR mentor or know someone who could lend their expertise to this process, please feel free to reach out to me to talk more about next steps and getting involved. Eventually, students produce original work that continues the conversation they tapped into at the beginning of this process. This finished product both uncovers what was already there, waiting to be revealed, and adds a new perspective at the same time. So while in some ways this night represents a culmination of this year of research, it is in other ways just the beginning of the process, should they choose to continue on this path. I'm happy to talk about this program, but you didn't come here to listen to me dialoguing like a Bond villain. I will lay out the format of the evening and introduce our first presenter in absentia. So each presenter has prepared a presentation that represents their year-long research. 
The presentations will last anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes. If you notice, there are index cards and pens at various points in the theater. Right as you walked in, you can, there's, a, there's a, a table with those things on it. These are for you to write down any questions, comments, or constructive critiques, Q, C, 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 you think of during the presentation. If you did not grab something to write with and to write on on your way in tonight, and you would like a note card and pen during a presentation, just raise your hand and I'll make sure they get passed down to you if they're not already accessible. At the end of each presentation, I will gather and read these QCCCs, and they will A, I mean answer, to the best of their ability. Hence the QCCC and A session. I will allow that process to continue until it is done, and then we will go on to the next presenter. And after everyone has presented, we're done. Please do feel free to linger for a bit to congratulate these amazing scholars for a year's worth of hard work and a presentation well done afterwards. I thank you for your attendance and your attentiveness, and would just ask you once again to make sure to you silence any electronic devices while the presentations are happening. Without any further ado, let's get the show started with our first presenter in absentia, Clara Evans. As you can see the titles of each presentation, Clara's presentation is on, uh, that is titled Tear Down This Wall, German Reunification. So Clara e examines the social and economic effects of German reunification policy in the 90s. So, <coughs> senior Clara Evans has spent the year researching the social and economic effects of German reunification in 1990. The collapse of global communism at the end of the 1980s had serious ripple effects through the former Soviet satellite states. And none of the former Warsaw Pact nations felt that disintegration more acutely than the former East Germany. The Cold War began in the shadow of the Second World War and had one of its earliest confrontations in the heart of Soviet-occupied portion of Germany. In 1948, to prevent Allied access to West Berlin, the USSR cut off ground and water access to the capital city. The Allies responded with the Berlin Airlift, sending much needed supplies to the citizens of West Berlin and avoiding another armed conflict just a few short years after the end of the most recent war to end all wars. Clara's story then shifts to the economic and ideological struggles in a developing East Germany. Under the leadership of prime ministers like Erich Honecker and Walter Ulbricht, the nation chafed under the constraints of a planned economy. Well, the Western portion of the divided nation thrived under the Marshall Plan and other Western attempts at economic revitalization, like the European Economic Community, a precursor to the EU. Reunification changed some things for the better and some things for the worse. Clara's story revolves around two former East German professionals whose credentials were not accepted in the new unified nation, which forced them to start essentially at the bottom and work their way back up the socioeconomic ladder. I will let Clara take it from here. Uh, she's not here, um, she's not feeling well, but she did send a pretty detailed summary, so the following represents her own summary of the project. So wherever I say I, it actually means Claire, not me. <laughs> okay. So, in an effort to put more of a personal and individual lens on the major historical events that we usually consider only from a geopolitical or overarching economic perspective, I researched the social and economic impacts of German reunification, not just on the countries of East and West Germany as a whole, but on the individual consumers as well. To do this, I looked at a variety of economic research papers, some from the 1990s, some from modern day, and considered various impacts that reunification had on consumers. These impacts included changes in purchasing power, consumer price index, employment opportunities, standard of living, and other economic metrics. I also studied different policies that the Soviet Union passed on to East Germany, and the effect that those had on citizens while the GDR still existed. These included collectivization of agriculture, deprivatization of businesses, and government control of market forces like supply and demand. Finally, I was interested to see how the actual policies of reunification disadvantaged East German citizens. So I looked into the currency union's effect on wages, the Troy Handenstalt's arbitrary auctioning of companies, and how the invalidation of Eastern work experience and education led to limited opportunities in the newly combined nation. To show an even more personal side of the policies, I interviewed two amazing German citizens who spoke to me, uh, spoke with me about their lives on opposite sides of the country before reunification. 
Interviewee 1, who wishes to remain anonymous, grew up and worked in the GDR, and gave an insightful perspective about how she and her husband were fired from their company after the unification, and struggled to find jobs in the new Germany because their qualifications came from Eastern German institutions. Interviewee 2, whose name is Barbara Fink, provided a great look into a Westerner's perspective of reunification, since she came from the West and actually moved to the East when the wall fell because Westerners could get better jobs there. She also told me about the company that she works for, which is owned by a Western entrepreneur who brought an East German company when the Treuhandenstalt was selling off pieces of the Kombinata to the West. Both interviewees were incredibly helpful and very generous for assisting me. I concluded that though the economic policy of reunification uplifted the economic status of East Germany as a whole, immediate and long-standing discrepancies in the economic status of East and West Germany can be attributed to the inefficiencies that total government control created on the economy of the GDR, the effects of the currency union and ensuing above market level wages, inferior technology, education and infrastructure, and the advantage that the Treuhandenstalt's dissolution of the Kombinata conferred on West German firms. These discrepancies manifested themselves in the social conflict, economic loss, and structural unfairness that has negatively affected individual East Germans from the early 1990s to the present day. So I asked Clara about her next steps, or any unanswered questions she would like to address with additional research in the future, and this is what she said. I would like to think more about the discrepancy between socialism in theory and socialism in practice, given that throughout history socialism has been combined with fascism, government overreach, tyranny, and many other social political factors that conflict with its theoretical ideals. In college, I plan to study international political economy, and I would like to learn more about the role that West Germany's association with, well, the Western world, and East Germany's with the Eastern world played in how they were viewed on the world stage. I definitely want to go back to Germany soon, since I haven't been able to in years, and actually understand more about the monuments and historical sites that I see, both in the West and the East. Hopefully Georgetown has a study abroad program, and we checked when we were talking and it does, so good for her. Um, and that, that was my aside, not her. Back to her. And continuing with the idea of the personal and the economic, I'd like to continue writing papers and doing research that includes actual people who would experience historical events, rather than just using numbers and summaries. And though I'm not sure how I can reconcile economic differences between two populations that reunified 30 years ago, I would like to take small steps locally to improve people's economic opportunity and financial health. In the short term, this involves doing something similar to what I did in the fall, which was work with underprivileged citizens of low socioeconomic status to fight for their due health care coverage, rent assistance, and similar things. There's a legal aid society in D.C., so I definitely plan to become involved with that again once I get there. Writing this paper made me realize that the systemic forces that can be found in a country's economy that totally disenfranchise populations, and I want to try to minimize the effects of those as best I can. Thank you for listening. Let's give Clara a round of applause. Yes. That was an awful. I had to practice those German sayings a few times um, before this. So um, She actually sent me a pronunciation guide, so that was easy. Uh, even though this brief description only scratches the surface of Clara's voluminous research, I hope it has done some justice to the full scope of her work this year. And I wish she was healthy enough to answer questions on this amazing project, but I would instead request that you join me in sending positive healing vibes her way over the next couple of days. So, thus concludes our first presentation. And boy, are you in for a ride now. So this, this is an idea of what IHR is all about, of what humanities research, where they can go, how it starts with a spark of interest and, and really takes them to places that, I mean, we just can't cover in the classroom. Um, so, so excellent job out of Clara. Our next presenter is senior Jamila Askira, whose project is titled Waking Up from the Dream. Oh, let me go back to that. Sorry. Decolonizing anti-black ideologies between African and African Americans pursuing the American dream. Um, before I welcome Jamila to the stage, let me just say that it has been an absolute pleasure this year um, just working with Jamila on this project. Um, it, it, when, I, when I use the phrase passion project, um, this is Jamila and, and our meetings are, is, is the first thing that pops into my mind. She has taken hold of this 
Um, it has been great to just see Jamila grow up since uh, sophomore U.S. history, and uh, she has been one of the most amazing history students that, that we've had. Um, her, her research and her determination um, will speak loudly in this presentation, and as they do um, in when we are in our meeting. So uh, please help me to welcome Jamila to the stage. Imagine you're sound asleep in your home in Bukuru Plateau State, Nigeria. You're suddenly woken up by a phone call. It's one o'clock in the morning. You pick up, concerned and confused. It's your girlfriend. She's currently temporarily moved to the United States for college. She goes on to talk about all the opportunities and uh, opportunities that will lie ahead in America that will never be available in Nigeria. Education, safety, an overall better life for you two and your future children. You're hesitant, but you know she's right. Before you know it, you're in Columbus, Ohio, having left your entire life and family on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. But you're full of hope, inspired by the American dream. This is the story of my parents, and growing up listening to this story has been immensely inspiring. I've learned so much about taking risks, working hard, and being resilient. I've also learned that the dream might not be all it's cracked out to be. My, my, my mother's feelings on the American dream haven't wavered much, but my father's, on the other hand, have drastically changed. Though grateful and blessed, he would always talk to me about how the American dream for immigrants comes with some social and economic setbacks, like being doubted in your job, constantly having to prove yourself, and all types of racism. Never having experienced racism in Nigeria, my parents were taken aback when they would receive it from their white counterparts. They were even more taken aback when they would receive it from their black counterparts. When, I would, when they would tell me this, I would always be so confused. Having growing up and navigating my Nigerian heritage and my African American identity hasn't always been easy. I've never felt pressure from these groups directly, but, I've, but as I've always had my foot in two places, I've gotten a chance to observe how African immigrants and African Americans view and feel about each other. I never truly understood the divide that I would see between these two groups. I always questioned, how could there be such animosity between African and African Americans if they're essentially chasing the same goals and are automatically grouped together by the rest of America? I've come to learn that it's a lot more complicated than that. Back in September, when I began brainstorming for my independent humanities research project, I knew that I wanted to research something that discussed the psychology between black people, but I needed a bigger concept to connect it all to. At the time, I was studying the American Dream in my advanced American studies class, and I found myself really intrigued in how different people can have different definitions and experiences in this dream. I further connected this to my personal connection between African and African Americans, and thus my IHR was born. Waking up from the dream, decolonizing existing anti-black ideologies between African and African Americans pursuing the American dream. The purpose of the study was to analyze what African immigrants' understanding of the American dream is and compare them to the experiences of African Americans in order to analyze how the visions of Africans reflect in anti-black ideologies towards African Americans and vice versa. The following research questions guided my study. What are African immigrants' views on the American dream? What are African American views on the American dream? Are there any commonalities between Africans and African Americans in their experiences and views on the American dream? How do African immigrants feel they are perceived by African Americans? How do African Americans feel they are perceived by African immigrants? How do each group's experiences in their American dreams affect how they perceive each other? And lastly, what black ideologies are present in how African immigrants and African Americans perceive each other? In the study, I used the subfield of anthropology called psychological anthropology to guide me through my research and my studies and my theor theoretical and empirical findings. Psychological anthropology is, quote, a subfield of anthropology devoted to understanding the way that cognition, emotion, and motivation shape our socio-cultural settings and the psychological factors that are important in culture learning and expression, end quote. 
These, um, there is a strong emphasis on identity, experience, emotion, belief, conscious goals and unconscious desires, conceptual structures and psychological development and diverse and cultural contexts. These emphases are very significant to my independent humanities research project because the American dream is such a vast concept, conceptual framework um, that forms a large part of the foundation of our American culture. By focusing on the experiences of African immigrants and African Americans, it makes the discussion more of this concept more personal and experience-based. This presentation will be split up into four sections. The first, oops, sorry. The first being an overview of Black diaspora. The second being uh, comparing African and African American experiences and the American dream, where I will introduce my survey and discuss the similarities and differences in the responses. Section three, exploring how African and African Americans experience in the American dream affect their perceptions of each other. Um, and lastly, section four, a discussion on the American dream and, inter and internalized racism, where I, will where I will discuss the correlations in my research and introduce possible reasons that address the overall disconnection between African and African Americans. The concept of home ownership, upward mobility, and the nuclear family unit will be used consistently throughout this presentation. Since people have their own experiences and episodic um, opinions on, about these terms, know that the ones I'm about to name are the, the definitions I'm about to name are the ones I'm referring to in this presentation. The American dream will be defined as the ideal that equal opportunities are available to every American, both born and immigrated, allowing success in their professional and personal lives. In terms of the study, upward mobility, home ownership, and the nuclear family unit will be the, my three defining factors of the American dream. Upward mobility will be defined as the capacity of raising to a higher social or economic position in the workplace and professional life. Home ownership will be defined as the ability to accumulate wealth by accessing credit, voting equity, and obtaining a house. Nuclear family will be, term will be defined as a unit consisting of at least one parent or one child and one child. And finally, as I approach the future sections where I talk about empirical and theoretical findings, black will be defined as a person with various kinds of skin pigmentation with an African ancestry. So in order to um, fully understand the rest of the presentation and um, just overall why black people immigrated and how they immigrated to the United States in the first place, um, it's important to have a semi-good understanding of African diaspora. In April Gordon's The New Diaspora, African Immigration to the United States, she provides a very detailed overview of black diaspora and all the components that have led to the large scale third world immigration that we have seen in the United States in the last century. Gordon's overall thesis is that the globalization of economies, lack of development, and immigration policies are reasons for the vast third world migration to the United States. So at the end of World War II, there was a dramatic expansion of the global cap capitalistic economy that linked the world together into a network of labor amongst countries, with Western industrial nations leading and providing manufactured goods, capital, technology, and markets. Previously to World War II, third world countries largely provided primary goods and cheap labor, although a rising number of newly industrialized countries had been flourishing due to foreign investments. The gap between growing aspirations and the ability to, of the country to adequately employ people and compensate them with decent living conditions can be, can be attributed to an overall failure of development at home. Both internal and regional conflicts, often religiously and ethically based, have played a great role in this lack of development, as well as, as, well as curating high levels of inter international migration. Globalization has also played a large role in the massive transfer of resources like te technology and capital possibility. The flow of, my, of international migration from the third world due to these things has grown to unprecedented levels. Before migrants found a new home in the United States, Europe actually used to be the golden destination for aspiring immigrants. Due to a rise of discriminatory limits placed on migrants' rights, mainly concerning citizenship and social mobility, the United States became more appealing to migrants because in Europe, migrants worked mostly in poorly paid jobs that the natives refused to do, regardless of their, poor, of, their, of their prior work skills and experience from their home countries. This overall made the U.S. a very attractive choice for migrants in search of a new home starting in 1965. Prior to 1965, um, because of different policies like the Immigration Act of 1924, um, restrictive policies made it very difficult for anyone not from Western Europe or Canada to migrate to the United States. 
1965, country immigration quotas were established by law, making it easier for third world, world citizens to migrate to the U.S. Also in 1965, the quota system that previously favored European um, pure, Europeans was replaced with a preference system that favored the entry, in, the entry of immediate relatives of U.S. citizens and permanent residents and those that were had, had skills needed to, in order to boost the um, American economy at the time. A new emphasis at this time was placed on the humanitarian concern of refugees. These changes produced a dramatic shift away from Europe to Latin America to Asia and eventually the United States as the main geographic source for immigrants. The Refugee Act of 1980 and the Immigration Act of 1990 also served as a major positive influence on African immigration to the United States. The 18 the, act of, the Refugee Act of 1890 and, um, allowed refugees to become eligible to adjust to permanent resident status after only one year of living in the United States. The Immigration Act of 1990 was designed in order to increase the number of skilled and employed immigrants compared to those admitted for the reason of family reunification. Thus, these acts introduced and invited African immigrants to work for the betterment and improvement of the American economy with the prior skills and knowledge they had obtained from their home countries. Despite American policy change, African immigrants proved to be very willing and open to migrate far from home in order to adjust to American society, um, in order to become more successful and established, influenced by the concept of the American dream. In terms of African Americans, many know that the origin and causes of their immigration is due to the infamous 1619 Project, but Gordon provides insight using specific numbers to show how black African immigrant immigration has differed over the years. In the very first diaspora of Africans to America during the slave period, um, about 20, 10 to 20 million Africans were transported to the U.S. And uh, following the importation of slaves, very few Africans arrived in the U.S. willingly. The immigration graph sh here shows that only about uh, 350 Africans migrated to the U.S. during that time. But during Africa's colonial period, um, from 1900 to 1950, over 31,000 Africans immigrated to the United States, which is an average of about 6,000 per decade. Now, on to section two, comparing African and African American experiences in the, in the American dream. Um, it's important to know that my research goal was to understand African immigrants' view on the American dream and determine how this idea influences their perspective on African Americans and vice versa. In order to do so, I constructed a Google form, a Google survey, to gain a better perspective from real life African American and African stories to people that were in my community or very close to my natives, saying that their families were very strong and loving and supportive. Um, those who did explain uh, negative experiences in the familial unit did mention the effects of either growing up in a broken home or currently having their children grow up in a broken home. One difference that I did see between the, new, between the two ethnicities in um, their familial unit experiences was that Africans did display um, more feeling towards having to work a lot of hours and the downside of not having, to spend, not having a lot of time to spend with their children and with the rest of their families. And other Africans also mentioned uh, a distance between their family back home in Africa because um, just growing apart due to family back home wanting money or stuff like that and, and expecting the family in America to provide for them even though the family in America was trying to provide for themselves. So prior to this survey, I suspected that Africans and African Americans were going to have vastly different experiences in the American dream that would you know, explain what I have been hearing all my life about the distance that were between them. So when I received the survey answers and that they were really similar experiences, I was very surprised. If both ethnicities were having, for the most part, the same experiences, where, what is the disconnect and where is it that explains their estrangement? On to section three. So after reviewing the survey answers, I had to shift my mindset from using black um, theories to explain the divide between these two groups to understanding how these black theories can explain the, the divide between these two groups, despite them having relatively similar experiences in their American dreams. Additionally, as I began a secondary research on black theories and ideologies, I quickly dug myself into a hole. I plan to take the results from my survey and relate them to existing black theories and beliefs. And though that's essentially the point of this section of my IHR, I found that going in with a mindset of decolonizing would make my research overall more authentic and nuanced. 
In order to decolonize black theories, it's necessary to destruct these settler-imposed systems that continue to oppress black people over different centuries. So when examining black theories, it's important to question the origin of the assumption. Most of the time, in terms of black theories, the origin being from white people in power who wish to weaken the bond between black people across America so they will re remain inferior socially, economically, systemically, all that kind of stuff. So as a part of my survey, I asked African participants to speak on how they feel they are perceived by African Americans. The majority of the responses that I received talked about feeling immensely out of place during their encounters with African Americans. Um, a lot of participants talked about feeling unwelcomed and an overall misunderstanding from African Americans about the struggle of being an immigrant in America. But they also mentioned um, feelings of feeling like they are seen as competition or inferior in the, work in the workplace compared to their African American counterparts. Um, but there were a couple um, people that did mention positive experiences saying that they feel like they serve as a reminder to African Americans of their roots in Africa and how they're um, seen as really admirable for having such a strong connection to their home countries. Also mentioned was um, people were mentioning that um, since the peak of the Black Lives Matter movement in the summer of 2020, they have seen a lot more unity and understanding between these two groups as they have realized that they're fighting for the same similar struggles in terms of equality, justice, um, and equity. Here is one quote from one of the African participants. Quote, I feel there is distrust. Although we, are both, I, as, although we both identify as black, we have different values and ethics. Africans feel they are more ambitious, thus more driven academically and in the workplace than their African-American counterparts, unquote. Another person stated, quote, for the uninformed, we are seen as people that are from the wild or as the competition that needs to be eliminated. Others see us as having the culture they wish for. However, on the wake of the violence and injustices against African-Americans like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, to mention but a few, I have seen unity and understanding amongst Africans and African-Americans that we are all one in this struggle. In sum, though African immigrants and African Americans have very um, same experiences in the American dream, we can see from the African perspective that there is still a disconnect seen from deep, deeply other rooted issues. I asked the same question to African Americans. Um, most of the responses talked about being feeling that they are seen as lazy, uneducated, or unwilling to work hard because they are viewed as uncul uncultured or whitewashed by other Africans. They mentioned feeling like Africans hold prejudice against um, them because they cannot trace back their lineage and make them feel like outsiders through their overall disconnection to Africa. Many stated that there is a severe misunderstanding between the two ethnicities and attributed that misunderstanding to um, Africans' first impression of African Americans being told by um, white people in power in that narrative kind of getting pushed away due to white supremacy um, uh, narratives. This one quote from an African American says, quote, African immigrants are taught what African, what Americans teach in general and every chance they get, that everything is bad because of African Americans. So there is never any need to notice all the lying, cheating, and stealing that white people do, did and continue to do, unquote. Another quote says, a white supremacist narrative tells our history and often erases the contributions of non-white people, thus leaving the masses ignorant due to mis misinformation and half truths. So as I dug into my theoretical findings and research, I found that W.E.B. Du Bois's double, double consciousness theory reflected many themes of what both the ethnicities were talking about and kind of provided a name to said feeling. In his 1897 speech, Strivings of the Negro People, he, defi he defines the double consciousness as the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of, of others and measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks in on amused contempt and pity. One feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two reconciled strivings, two warring ideas in one dark body, whose dog truth alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Du Bois uses this double consciousness to discuss a two-ness felt between African Americans during their, um, between their African identity and their American identity that was forced upon them during the slave period. I believe that this concept not only holds true in, t in 21st century African Americans today, but also in African immigrants today, with their tunis being between their identity as Africans in their home countries and their new identity as African Americans um, as they immigrated to America. I would even go further to argue that African immigrants might experience an additional component to this tunis, um, that being their identity as an American outside of being African American. 
Du Bois explains this feeling of double consciousness as a longing to attain self-consciousness manhood, to merge his doubleness into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes for neither of the older selves to be lost. This double and triple consciousness can be heavily seen in my responses, in my survey responses, as both ethnicities um, express uh, experiences of feeling that do not fit in with each other's perception of each other, which only further draws them apart. Now to section four, discussion on the American dream and internalized racism. So in the beginning of this IHR process, I suspected that the reason for the general animosity between African and African Americans had to be directly correlated to their experiences in the American dream. I'm now ending my project with a whole new understanding and perspective. Through my survey, I found that Africans and African Americans have had similar understandings and views and experiences in the American dream. Therefore, that cannot be the reason for their distant nature. I now believe that this apparent distance is due to many deeper and somewhat uncontrollable factors. In the Forbes article, Black is not a monolith, an exploration of how the Black American and Black immigrants experiences diverge, Janice Asser contributes this divide to generational trauma, socioeconomic status, and discrimination, and internalized racism. In terms of generational trauma, researchers from the National Library of Medicine have found that children are directly impacted from the exposure of their parental trauma. Asir writes, quote, trauma can leave a lasting impact on an individual and can be inherited from one generation to the next, unquote. Due to being descendant of enslaved people, African Americans have, have inherited the generational trauma that was felt and inevitably passed on <laughs> through their ancestors. Africans were stripped from their culture, identity, and heritage, and the term for this is post-traumatic slave syndrome. For many African Americans, the barriers that they face in, in today's world could feel self-made, but truly it could be attributed to the unaware, uh, that they are unaware of their generational trauma. This trauma can also be a reason for why there's a distance between African immigrants and African Americans upon meaning, as Africans can remind African Americans of their concealed and unresolved generational trauma. Switching to the component of socioeconomic status, according to the Pew Research Center, Africans with a higher education um, are more likely to move to more developed nation nations, which could explain the difference between educational attainment amongst different black groups in America today. This difference in possible and possible academic achievements serve as another reason for the lack of unity between these two groups because both ethnicities might believe that they are more deserving to have a higher socioeconomic status between their two relationships. This can also be connected to the feeling of being seen as con con competition and inferiors that were both seen in my survey from both ethnicities. Lastly, discrimination and internalized racism play a big role in the apparent social distance between African and African Americans. In her 2012 doctoral dissertation, Adobe Induru conducted research that was very similar to my survey, um, where she asked African and African Americans to talk about their perceptions of each other. She identified many negative stereotypes that each group um, felt towards each other, and that, and, that, and that they both viewed each other as lesser than. Her findings strongly, strongly aligned with mine as I concluded my research. In sum, Generational trauma, socioeconomic status, and internalized racism serve as three main components that stand in between the camaraderie between African immigrants and African Americans today. So prior to my IHR, due to the um, conversations that I had with my family and the different Africans and African Americans in my life, I believe that the two ethnicities had to have two different experiences in their American dream in order to explain why they both see each other in such a negative light. But after completing my IHR, I'm just now to, uh, beginning to understand how deep this truly is. I found that Africans and African Americans have quite similar, ex like, very extremely similar experiences in upward mobility, home ownership, and obtaining a solid familial unit, but they both feel a sense of being seen as competition or outsiders when they're around each other. The theory of the double consciousness helped conceptualize how the how the two ethnicities feel as they move throughout America, similar but separate, but didn't provide an answer to um, what exactly is separating these two. Generational trauma, socioeconomic status, and internalized racism serve as the three main components that I found are um, the reasons for why there is such a distance between these two ethnicities. These three topics serve as very strong pinpoints to concrete reasons to why the dynamic between African and African Americans are so strained in America today. 
But as African Americans and Africans become more aware of the psychological um, unconscious effects of these topics and how they, how they affect the perception of each other, there could be um, a real chance of changing this animosity into camaraderie. Confronting these three components is not as easy as I'm making it seem. It is up to African and African Americans to work to decolonize psychological these psychologically unconscious topics together to gain a better understanding of each other and build a new generation where the two ethnicities can learn to stand stronger together rather than weaker apart. Thank you. Digest in, in one go. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna allow you to, um, to digest if you must. Uh, like I said, there are um, there are no cards for you to write questions. I, I'm actually kind of this is the first time I've done this. I'm kind of second guessing that here. Um, I have a microphone and lights, and I'm, I'm considering uh, I have uh, uh, I have a question already. Um, I'm considering just allowing you, sometimes it's better to just kind of articulate a question, uh, doing like the Phil Donahue Oprah style, <laughs> maybe doing something like this, I don't know. Um, so, oh, I've got, I've got a hand over there and I've got uh, another hand over here, so I think I'm going to do the, the Phil Donahue and Oprah style. I don't know. <laughs> Hi, Jamila. Hello. Um, so Jamila, first I want to compliment you on your presentation as well as your research. Um, and my question comes from part three of your presentation. Um, so I really appreciated the overview that you gave of the theory of double consciousness and W.E.B. E. Du Bois. And you, you started to use a term of uh, triple consciousness that I had not heard um, before as, as I've read scholarship. So the first part of my question is, is triple consciousness something that's out there in the literature or is that something that you've um, coined. And then my second question is, um, if you could talk a little bit more about that idea of triple consciousness. I was just intrigued when you um, mentioned this idea of African immigrants having an African identity, African American identity, and American identity, and I would be fascinated for you to talk more about that. That was a lot of questions. <laughs> Um, so in my research, I did not see anything about a triple identity or con the triple consciousness. I actually kind of thought about it when I have one of my meetings with Mr. Brown. So I, I will say that we kind of coined that together. Um, and when I talk about that, yes, I think that there is a consciousness that has to do with their heritage at home and that entire life that they know in their home countries. And then coming to America and adjusting to being an American and just that whole thing and like American politics, you know, the college life, like my parents, they just did the college life, politics, credit, all that kind of stuff, things that most Americans wouldn't really think about, but from um, a different person from a different country, it's a completely new world. And then on top of that, having the added pressure that they were receiving or can, could be receiving from African Americans can make them feel like they should be a part of that culture, but um, ultimately, like I discussed, like the outsideness and the, the um, otherness that they would feel would make it a little bit different. Great question, great answer. Let's, uh, let's go. Dr. Sullivan has a question. How did this research and engaging in a year-long project either affirm or change what you're interested in studying in college? It definitely affirmed it. I previously was planning to go in um, majoring in psychology and then I wanted to minor in African and Black diaspora studies. So when I was presented with this opportunity, I wanted to really kind of dive into what I would hopefully want to be doing later in college. And as I dive in, dived into it more, I have kind of shifted um, more from not only being interested in like how African diaspora, African experiences affect people today, or African American experiences today, but um, this product really let me get um, really deep dive into like the past and how the past really affects it. So um, it definitely like really affirmed my beliefs and my passion for it. All right, next question. Hi, Jamila. Good job. Um, my question is: Do you see this being an uh, issue in our generation, or do you think it will start to go away between the African Americans and? 
Um, I really do think, like someone mentioned in my survey, that 2020 was kind of a game changer for all of America, and not only just African Americans, but I believe that the unity that that person talked about of um, between Africans and African Americans can truly be said for our next generations because through social media and gaining a better history and just kind of being more aware of the truths and non-truths between African history and African American history, I really do think that our generation is uh, more understanding and more connected and ready to kind of make this change. Next question. All right, Jamila, thank you for this fantastic presentation. First of all, I want to commend you on some great work that you've done. I mean, I've seen undergrad presentations, and this was way better than many of those that I've seen, so well done to you. Um, I have a question about research, uh, because you actually conducted a survey, and I remember when I was in school, my supervisor used to tell me that research is a messy business. Mm -hmm. And so, which part of this process do you find intriguing and what was the most important thing you learned when you were doing this research? The actual meeting research, collecting data and analyzing it. But good job. Um, my closest friends know that I spend all of my free time on JSTOR, just like browsing scholarly articles and like saving all these articles and reading them in my free time. So I literally had like a whole like folder for just like fun reads and then I had like a folder for my IHR reads um, and it was really fun like finding the articles and then when I sat down to like dissect it it was overwhelming really fast because it's a lot of information a lot of different decades to talk about different centuries to talk about um, but one of the biggest things that I took away from analyzing research and um, just dissecting it in general is allowing my initial thesis or hypothesis or idea to change over time because like i mentioned like going into it i was like oh well it has to be because they have different experiences like that has to be the reason why there's such a disconnect but as i did my research and the research kind of pointed me in that same direction um, being able to connect my research and like the hard data with real life personal experiences definitely made the presentation kind of come together and feel more real and you know nuanced and authentic Next question. Hi, um, I do want to congratulate you. you you're so articulate on um, the historical and the theoretical and your research elements. So congratulations. You will be a dream to whoever gets to teach you in college. <laughs> My question um, is, um, who do you see working on this um, to help heal these communities and to bring about unity? Is it, is it partly the schools? Is it is it churches? Is it community centers? Where do you see the healing start to happen? I think that there are a lot of different ways where it can start. One being like in the household and just having conversations between you know African households or African American households of like an accurate history and a honest and um, more like. I don't want to say positive because the history is not so positive, but ending it with a positive narrative, but like we're all connected. And now that I'm thinking about it, I also think the schools can play a big role of just, you know, not teaching, you know, black history just for one month and kind of teaching it all throughout. So if an African American or African child isn't getting that full experience, being able to learn in the classroom throughout the year that, um, you know, the trauma that they might be trying to struggle through or they might be experiencing or questions that they might have. Um, have answers or that there's a reason for it and that there's a future for it and all those different kinds of things. Yeah. Next question. I don't know that this is a question. It is a request for you and your teacher. Fantastic job on the presentation. And I'm kind of sad to see you graduate and leave the one to go to the team. <laughs> two places with the parents raising black children. I don't know how you and your teacher can figure out for this presentation to stay with us so that our children, the ones in third grade, first grade, can be able to see this work that you have done. It is very enlightening and I just, I could not have put this better in myself, myself, but, and you brought the perspective from three different places and unified them so seamlessly. I really want the children and the younger ones to see this work. Whatever you guys can do to keep this, please do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. By the way, it's it is still being recorded, right? Um, so.
we are we are doing our level best to try to preserve this for, for posterity, um, and, and we will pass it on to a foot in two places and wherever wherever else it needs to go. So that this is this is part of, of IHR. This is humanities research. We want to keep this going um, so that you know whoever wants to see it on the Wellington site can, can see it. So thank you. Any other questions, comments, constructive critiques for Jamila? Since this is being recorded, I wanted to put it on the record that you would be a great student to be a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> so as you go on to Chicago, no keep that in mind. Um, but we'll be here to support. So dream higher, higher and higher. <laughs> let me just let me just add to that and say, um, if Jamila is going to go on to a PhD. She is going to need a ton of support from her community, from her village. And so if that is an aspiration that her village has for her, make sure that you stay connected in every way possible to make sure that she can continue to pursue that. Um, if that is an, an individual dream, which, I mean, even yeah. I, let's let's <laughs> make sure that whatever the next level is, but um, if, it's a, if it's a collective dream, there's only one way that that's going to Questions, comments, constructive critiques. All right, let's give Jamila one more round. I do want to say just a huge thank you to Dr. Brown, who's actually Clara's mom, who got me in touch with Dr. Goins, who helped me um, organize my research and my like big idea, gave me an outline to work on my essay, Miss Robbins for proofreading my big crazy essay, all of the survey participants in my family and my village for supporting me and listening to me talk about this for nine months, and of course Mr. Brown, you've been the best person to work with on this. So good. Well done. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I say at the beginning of this? Well, this is going to be. All right. Um, can we take a couple of minutes just to kind of breathe a little bit um, before we get into uh, to end? I don't want to just kind of railroad into the next thing. Um, let's see. All right. Perfect. So why don't we reconvene at eight o'clock, and we can. Uh, and Annabelle um, will do uh, her her project's on performative social justice, and uh, and and if you thought that was good, be prepared. Okay. Five minutes. Eight o'clock. We'll see you there. So after this is all done, um, we'll have an opportunity for people if you want to um, take photos of of either Annabelle or Jamila at the podium with their with their title slide up or anything you want to do. We'll have plenty of opportunity for that to happen as well. All right. I had I mean I had questions prepared. I didn't know what was going to happen. This is the first time that we that we have done this in this in this setting. Um, thank you for for all of your uh, participation, attentiveness, enthusiasm, and all of that. Um, and I would just ask you to, to keep that going for our next presenter, um, Junior Annabelle Kreiger, um, whose project focuses on the intersection of performing arts and social justice. So let me just uh, let me just say a little about Annabelle. Um, I, as I was thinking of the remarks that I was going to make, um, I remember, and I, I, I couldn't believe that this was just last year, um, so one of the things uh, that we did in our unit of World War I um, was we had, uh, I had them prepare some sort of um, creative project. And, uh, and Annabelle uh, chose to, uh, to do the topic of Meatless Mondays, which was a thing in World War I. And, uh, but Annabelle um, uh, made a song, made a jingle, and sang it um, and, and, and had her ukulele and recorded it in a movie. And that was it was excellent, but she wasn't sure that she wanted it played in front of in front of the class. She wanted to leave the classroom before it was performed because she was uh, she wasn't sure how it would be received and things like that. I think about that now because I mean, well, you'll see. <laughs> she is, this 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 whole thing about performative social justice. She has really taken on both the social justice and the performative aspects of it, and just has soared with it. So um, that's what I will say in preview of that. Please uh, help me to welcome to the stage uh, Annabelle Cracker.
So, as Mr. Brown just said, I am an artist, and as an artist and musician who is passionate about social justice issues, I am interested in the ways that the arts are used to rebel against or educate society about deeply troubling issues like sexism, racism, ableism, homophobia, and all of the injustices. So when I started this project, I had two main goals. To research how the arts have been used to address social justice issues and to compare written history with lived history to see if there were any contradictions, but also to deepen my own understanding of the topic. Now, before I get started, my presentation is set up in a very similar way as Jamila's. I have different sections of different topics, and I even made three podcasts this year, so you might even hear some audio clips from those. So, my first point of entry was the Riot Girl movement, which is a punk rock movement for women. And as you may notice, they spell girls, G-R-R-R-L. And I see the spelling as a growl, like grr, kind of to express their anger towards society about the way that they oppress girls and women. So this movement grew out of the male-dominated punk rock movement, which is known for being very violent and pushing girls to the back of the room at concerts, especially with their mosh pits, because people would enter these with, or exit these with broken bones, bruises, and bloody noses. And the funny thing is, the punk movement is supposed to be about standing up to the man, and so it's supposed to be very political, but at the same time, it was extremely sexist. In the 1990s, two high school girls from Seattle, Molly Newman and Allison Wolf, put a band together and sang about issues important to women in their 20s. These issues included abortion, rape, incest, and eating disorders. These two women even boycotted mainstream record labels because female musicians were being paid much less than male musicians at this time. And from this, a movement was born. The Riot Girl movement is a counter-punk rock movement for women. They said that you didn't need to be a musician, you just had to have the right attitude. And a lot of their concerts were focused on women. They even had this motto, girls to the front, where they would bring the girls who had been pushed to the outer edges of concerts to the front so they could safely enjoy it without the fear of being injured in a mosh pit. The Riot Girls also wrote songs for women and about women, like this one. in their style. For my song, I chose the topic of body shaming because it was very prevalent on the social media app TikTok. See, anytime I would open the app, there was always a video of a woman complaining about how TikTok would ban curvy girls who were dancing in bikinis. They would ban their videos, but they wouldn't ban the videos of skinny girls, even though the curvy girls dancing was against their community guidelines, but they let the skinny girls slip right through. In this song, there were artistic choices that I made that are well beyond my personal style and comfort zone because I don't usually scream lyrics in the same way the Riot Girls do, but I still try to find a happy medium. I would perform this song live for you today, but I use some percussion and effects that I can't replicate live, but I do have a recording, and so I give to you, Shut It Down. <laughs>
movement as it started, it was also thought to have brought about third wave feminism, which is all about reclaiming and redefining ideas about womanhood, beauty, and sexuality. And one thing that also came with this was consciousness raising groups. These are groups where women would gather and discuss feminist issues and support each other. And with this also followed the term girl power. To learn a little more about these consciousness groups, I talked to my aunt, Katie Hensel, who is a former riot girl, about about these groups. Um, a group that got together called Stitch and Bitch. <laughs> and so basically it was the girls would get together at one of the bars in Milwaukee, a, a watering hole, and I think at the time it was probably foundation, just kind of visit and work on projects, whether that was something that you were knitting, or um, I think it was mostly knitting. Some girls did some cross stitch and stuff like that. So it was really just a support system, but again, there were feminist issues that were brought up, you know, frequently again, you know, um, you know, why, why do we get paid less, you know, than men? What do we do as much work, if not a lot of times more, in my opinion, <laughs> but again, that's my opinion. So um, yeah, we definitely had feminist issues on the table. One huge part of the radical movement was DIY culture. And one part of DIY culture was the belief that anyone could be in a band. It doesn't matter if you're a classically trained artist or just picked up a guitar for the first time and wanted to record a song. If you wanted to make music, you could make music. The issue is this is why a lot of times their music was quite simple. Another part of DIY culture is the crafting. See, so these crafts in themselves were very political, but these crafts would also be at riot girl concerts and conventions. And so not only were they political, but they also brought women together. And as you may notice on this slide behind me, this woman is not holding a gun, but a glue gun. Now, one thing a lot of these girls like to make were zines or magazines, but they were handmade and anyone could make them. And they were also very political. They would have poems or writings or pictures, anything you wanted. If you could make them or you had a group of friends that wanted to make them and you had a photocopy, you could do anything. Other than the patriarchy, one of the biggest obstacles the riot girls had to face was the media. When their movement first started, they gained a lot of media attention, which is good because it helped to spread their message, but it's also bad because they focused more on the way that the riot girls presented themselves rather than their actual message. Eventually, this frustrated the riot girls so much that they decided to do a media blackout. And while the idea was good, it, sadly, it only caused more media attention because they wanted to know, well, why aren't you responding to us? And with the media now coming even harder at the riot girls, there were some girls who ended up breaking out of the silence against the wishes of the movement, trying to explain why they were doing the blackout. But sadly, this only caused an internal struggle. Another issue the riot girls faced was their lack of diversity. You see, they have this motto, every girl is a riot girl, but in actuality, this wasn't true. Like many feminist groups that have been seen in history, the riot girls were mainly led by white, middle-class women. So when this lack of diversity was brought up to them, they did attempt to diversify themselves, but it was just not very well put together, and sadly, it just led to the end of their movement. So to learn a little more about the end of this movement, I talked to Molly Snyder, a journalist, but also a former riot girl and who sang in a band about her. The, oh, never mind. We took that interview out. But I talked to her about this and kind of <laughs> in the end, she said that she felt it wasn't really genuine enough, even with their attempts to try and diversify, it didn't really work out in the end. And so with this, I kind of came to a few realizations. I realized that punk music isn't for everyone, so it's not a surprise that Riot Girls weren't for all women. It's difficult to successfully be all things to women, so it would have been better if the Riot Girls had said, this is who we are and what we're fighting for. Because I think that would have been much better than having their entire movement end. And finally, just fighting for equality isn't enough. You have to consider whose equality you're talking about and who is being left out. It's okay to not be all things to everyone, but I'm still thinking about how you can be your thing and your true self without demeaning or damaging others. Okay, so here's the first pause. So if you want to write down any questions, go ahead. Otherwise, I just have a short little song. 
because he's the head of the household, automatically assuming I was not. And I explained to him, like, I am also the head of the household because I'm the one that had the college degree and my husband at the time did not. 
So there's that assumption, right, that the mayor was the one that was in charge and that was responsible for bringing in the money and that I really didn't need to be paid as much because I was a woman. It is curious that sexist stereotypes worked in this manner when Ms. Robbins first started teaching. From what I understand, teachers don't make a lot of money to begin with. I wonder what they thought she would do with the extra income if she earned the same as her male counterpart. My health teacher, Mr. Neely, has been limited by colleagues and friends stereotyping his work because he teaches human sexuality, a somewhat uncomfortable topic full of taboo conversations. There are a, a number of colleagues that, that don't find my approach or don't find my uh, the content to be professional. And so it, it kind of sets me in an awkward position of, of, of knowing that I may have crossed somebody else's value or moral threshold when I'm answering a, a question or approaching a topic that a student has genuine interest in. Mr. Neely said that this stereotype makes him self-conscious about his interactions with students. He worries that the anxiety from this stereotype compromises his ability to meet students' needs when they have genuine questions or concerns about difficult topics. Two of my friends address stereotypes they confront because of being from different cultures. Flo describes herself. So, I am Puerto Rican, right? And my entire life I've like gone to like private schools and my mom's family is white and relatively wealthy. We go to this club every summer and it is majority white people. And like people will often assume I'm not related to my mother or I am from a poor family or not upper class or I don't go to Wellington because I'm Porter, you know, like because I am not, do not appear upper class, you know. Flo told me that a woman at a club her family visits every summer greeted her family and talked about how beautiful her sister was and how much she resembled her mother and her aunt. Her sister is fair-skinned and can pass, unlike Flo, who looks more Puerto Rican. These assumptions hurt her deeply, and she worries about just how much the stereotype will hinder throughout her life. Then I read about like stuff on the news and everything that's going on, and I'm like, I want to help, but I'm part, part of so many different minorities. Does my voice, will my voice really even ever be taken into consideration because I am part of like the LGBTQ community I'm a person of color, I am female bodied, like because I'm all of these things, will my voice ever really get taken into consideration? My friend Iyanu is Nigerian, and he explains that there are strict expectations of him based on gender stereotypes in his community. In the Nigerian community specifically, I'd say men who do anything effeminate, like paint their nails, wear makeup or anything, are often looked down upon. Um, people in general who try to pursue careers outside of being a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer um, are, are looked down upon some, especially if those careers are in like liberal arts or, um, or something like that. Uh, and I guess just broadly, there are a lot of homophobic stereotypes that we still have to unpack as a community. Both Yanu and Flo are looking at lifelong obstacles because of how people stereotype their ethnicities. Flo faces a world that will question her on so many fronts, while Yanu will likely be shoehorned into an acceptable career and limited definitions of masculinity. My advisor, Mr. Hansen, and friend Roman both feel judged and stereotyped because of their political beliefs, even though they are on opposite ends of the political spectrum. Uh, I've been stereotyped sometimes uh, politically because I tend to think uh, the things on the right, you know, liber libertarian and conservative, people tend to think that there's a certain things that you do or think because of that. Uh, and uh, recently, because of some of this, uh, the racial justice stuff that's gone on, um, when, with white privilege and whatnot, people assume that you're a certain way because you just look a certain way. I think the biggest and most occurring, reoccurring one has been like the blue haired leftist. Um, because I'm very far to the left on the political spectrum and I'm very uh, serious 
about making that known and about like, calling out people's bullshit. Being stereotyped because of your political beliefs plays out differently for these two. Mr. Hansen says that he often holds back his opinion so as not to offend people too much, especially because he's a teacher who wants to help students find their voices. But as a big believer in free speech, this is a painful compromise, as painful as people thinking they know things about him because of his politics. Rowan is just the opposite. They go fiercely on the offense when they hear someone using any sort of disrespectful language. They admit that they've lost friends over it, but they'd rather live in a world where they speak their truth regardless of the consequences. So, well, for the Riot Girls, my performance was to make a song. For the Gorilla Girls, the performance I decided to do was a piece of artwork where I looked at stereotypes that I have felt either placed on me or that I could feel people could place on me just from their first glance at me. And this is the piece that I made. So, after talking about all of these stereotypes, one may wonder, well, how can you break outside of these? Well, the Gorilla Girls have an answer for you. Go eight. This means call things out when you see them, educate others about your experience, and be your authentic self and don't apologize. Now, I would add one more point to this. I would say make heart-to-heart -heart connections so that way when there are disagreements, it's easy to forgive and learn from each other instead of to just judge each other and separate. This is the break point for the second part, so if you want to write down any questions, you can before moving on to the third part here. After spending quite a bit of time in feminism, I decided to move on to queer theory. And this seemed like the logical next step to me because, in a way, feminism is the parent of queer theory. So to put it simply, queer theory is a lens used to explore how gender identities are created out of societal beliefs and ideologies. Now, historically, gender has been seen as you are either male or female. But queer theory challenges this idea by revealing its limitations through the use of binary oppositions. So what is a binary opposition? It's a way of thinking that society has internalized and takes for granted. Or simply put, it is two opposing ideas or concepts. Typically, one side of the binary has more power, which then creates a boundary between the two groups that only leads to prejudice and discrimination. So let's look at a familiar binary, man versus woman. Now, as you may see on this slide here, there are adjectives under each side to describe it. You have masculine, feminine. Stronger, weaker, worker, mother, administrator, teacher, president, and vice president. Now, when looking at these adjectives, there's already a power differential between them. But when you put them under their side, it truly shows that the man is in the power in this binary. So let's apply this binary opposition to my daily life. If I was sitting in class and I randomly decided I wanted to crack the whole class up with this joke, everyone would look at me as though I was insane. Because while we've normalized this behavior for teenage boys, it is way outside of the expectations we've set for teenage girls. On the other hand, here at Wellington, the girls wear plaid skirts for the uniform. But if a boy were to wear the skirt, everyone might be okay with it for the first day or two because they'll think he's joking. But if the boy was intent on wearing the skirt for the entirety of the school year, he would have a long way to go in terms of making everyone else feel comfortable with his decision. So, from these examples, it can be seen that if you're on the wrong side, or as my readings have said, the other side of the binary, then in these examples you would be seen as a social outcast, which is the last thing any high school student would want. So, as you see, there's typically like the normal or what everything's set by, and then the other. And to give you some other examples here of these like power differentiations, there's the white people versus people of color. There is heterosexuals versus homosexuals. There's what we have set as the norm or see mostly in the media versus the other, who typically we do not learn about, who may not get the benefit of the doubt. And there's just, there's, it doesn't feel like there's a pressing need to learn about you because you're not as present in society or in what people are seeing. Now, 
For this performance in this unit, I decided to look into TV shows and movies. And the TV show I looked into is one I think we all know and love, Friends. So the first example I have is in one episode, Ross's wife decides to give his son a Barbie doll. Now, the son likes the Barbie doll, but this makes Ross fear that his son would be gay, because boys can't like feminine things. So he tries to give his son a G.I. Joe. Now this back and forth is played throughout the entire episode, but it just reinforces this heterosexual, homosexual binary by saying that if your kid is gay, that's a bad thing. You want your kid to be straight so they can have that privilege and security that comes with it. The second example is when Ross's wife marries a woman. As you can see in these pictures, they dress both of them very femininely, which fits the heterosexual perspective of what a woman should look like. They make them appear very soft, they put them in these beige feminine colors, and they don't even have a kiss at the end of the episode. And it was later released that the producers didn't have the two women kiss because they believe it would have been too much for their heterosexual audience to handle. The third example from this show is Chandler's father, who is a transgender woman. Now, once again, Friends is trying to be progressive, but they didn't actually hire a transgender woman to play the role. They used a cisgender woman. And so that's only playing, once again, into the heterosexual perspective. So even though they were trying to be progressive, they're just reinforcing this heterosexual, homosexual binary. So in looking at these examples, my analysis is that even though Friends was trying to be progressive, they still used the undesirableness of the other as a continuous punchline, which only continued to maintain the traditional heterosexual, homosexual binary that continues to marginalize homosexuals. So now, let's skip ahead to the 2018 movie Love, Simon. In this movie, 17-year-old Simon is a closeted high school boy, and his account claims there is a closeted person at the school. Now that Simon is afraid that his secret may be revealed, he starts having conversations with Lou. And one of these flips the gay-straight binary. Click on what? Yeah, I'm trying to see where the mouse went. Maybe it's because it doesn't seem fair that only gay people have to come out. Why is straight the default? I have something I need to tell you. Mom, there's something I have to tell you. Can, can we talk? Yeah. I'm straight. I'm straight. I'm sorry, Mom. It's true. I like girls. I get that from your dad, is that? I like girls with neck. is a lot more realistic in terms of the stuff that we've looked at, right? Um, it shows us the impact of societal limitations on identity. And it does it in a really you know, realistic but funny way um, with all of these people coming out as straight and seeing the reactions of the parents, which are a gamut of different things, just like um, I've heard or I would suppose it's the same for people coming out um, with whatever their sexuality is, people that feel as if they need to come out, right? And that does a really good job of highlighting the fact that binary thinking is socially constructed. We as a society, most often unintentionally, are told 
what to think about people based on whatever their identity is, right? Whether we believe that it's wrong or right based on whatever our society or our culture tell, tells us, whether we want to other it, um, even whether it's just perceived as different or outside the quote unquote norm. You know, we can see air quotes in a, in a podcast, so I promise I'm giving them to you, right? Uh, and so this is a clear example of the power structures that these social constructs really do highlight for us every day. Um, I'm a straight, cisgender woman. I just started bringing boyfriends home when I was in high school. I never had to like have a conversation with my parents. It wasn't necessary because it's kind of what was expected. So as I was <clears throat> learning about these concepts of binary opposition and othering, it showed me that our lives are structured so that we learn on subtle levels who counts and who doesn't. Fortunately, there are groups of people who resist this message and create their own meaning. And I believe that those are the people who change the world. And when you take a closer look, many of them are artists. So, once again, I'll give you all a quick little break to think of questions or if you want to write anything down before I move on to this last little segment here. So, as my IHR was coming to an end, I realized I wanted to do my own form of performing social justice. The issue was deciding what topic I wanted to learn about and also how to best support it. So to start, I did a TED talk about transgender immigrant women and their experiences. And from this, I thought, oh my god, this is what I would love to do. And so I started reaching out to organizations. But after I called about 15, I soon realized it's just as dangerous for these people to be visible here in the United States as it is back in their home country because they're still living with the same kinds of people. So seeing as this was not going to be a possibility for me, I was fortunate enough to meet Nora Bakringa, a survivor of the Rwandan genocide. She's also the founder of Rwandan Women in Action, an organization that helps Rwandan women who are fleeing Rwanda get settled here in the United States, whether that be giving them a place to live, a place to work, or even teaching them English. And I've actually been helping Nora with teaching these women English because in their country it is not a priority to educate girls. So when they come here to the United States, these women have to rely on men or their children to help them with their taxes or even notes from school. So when these women learn English, they gain an independence. So this Saturday, I am performing a benefit concert for Nora. Me and my friend Maya will be singing songs, but we will also have Nora here to talk about her story, but also her organization. And for this, I have also written a song for the performance that I would love to sing for all of you tonight.
you, and also before I go, I'd love to say thank you for Mr. Brown for all of your support this year. And thank you to my friend, Dr. Ashley. She couldn't be here tonight, but big thanks to her and her health. But also thanks to my mother, who is a feminist herself and a music professor. And she's, she's really the one who's kept me on track this year. Like, she's like, get on to your IHR. But like, really, thank you to everyone. And thank you to everyone who came out tonight. I really appreciate it. I thought for a second the mic had gone, but Mr. Clever just fixed it and made it better, as he does. He does things like that. Um, again, mind-blowing. I'm so proud of, of the, the performances and so proud of, of, of the, the students. Um, now let's open the floor to any questions, comments, uh, constructive critiques, anything that you have to say. Um, let's, let's open the floor to that. You did awesome. <laughs> Constructive receipt. Comment? You did awesome. Excellent. Thank you, Annabelle. That was very, very well done. Congratulations on all the hard work that went into it. This was fantastic. Um, first, I am a podcast head. I, I read in podcasts. And so uh, when I was listening, especially the first part of your talk, um, on Girl Power, um, there's an episode of um, 90s History, I don't know if you've heard of that podcast. Um, there's an episode titled Girl, uh, Girl Power, I think you uh, Some of the ideas that we talk about here are uh, very much in, in the work that, that you do, so you can explore more uh, some of the things that happened in the 90s, but also before that will be great. Um, what I, I have sort of a question, which is really a very, a very general, broad question. Um, two places that have been responsible for progress, general progress in society. The arts, which you are very much into and you outline, but also in universities. Uh, that these are the two places where independence of thought have led to progress in the world. Um, whether it's on human rights issues, or whether it's just on development and technology related, or just advancements of society. These two have been responsible for pushing society forward. So I'm curious um, about you know the path that you know you you, you have moving forward. That whether you intend to um, build on some of these ideas that you've uh, presented so beautifully today, um, moving into the university, whether these are some of the things that um, you intend to pursue and continue to grow and that independence of thought and hopefully push some of the boundaries. Um, around minority related issues that you are outlining here. But thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, the way that I would build on this, I know that when I go to college, I definitely want to find a way to still continue to be in the arts, whether that's music or art itself, but also with social justice. Like ever since I was a little kid, I've loved music, but I've also loved social justice. I've been surrounded by it since I was little. So I definitely want to find a way to continue to combine and kind of continue this type of concept as I get older so I can make the change I hope to make in this world. Thank you. Great response. Okay. While I'm here. <laughs> um, amazing job, Annabelle. The first thing I want to say is that song was amazing. It was so, so catchy good. and the message is so great. So I just want you to put that on YouTube and Spotify and just get it out there in the world. <laughs> Yes, Apple Music, all the things. Um, so my question was uh, about the first part of your presentation. I really enjoyed learning about the Riot Girls and the Guerrilla Girls. Those were two movements I knew very little about. Um, and it sounded like they had um, kind of very different um, tactics, I suppose, like along their journey. Um, and I was wondering, like, um, what are some of your, how would you compare the movements? I suppose, like I'm, I'm thinking about like the riot girls coming from this like punk tradition um, and kind of relying on the way that the media portrayed them to get their message out um, versus like this other group, the Gorilla Girls, that just put the billboards up for everyone to see. So I'm just kind of curious like um, what your reflections are about those two movements. Yeah, so with the Riot Girls, I feel like they used their music as a platform to spread their message. Like, they, their music was about the same political things they were t talking about in their uh, conventions and meetings. 
Uh, but I feel like they kind of used it, they used the arts as a platform, while the Guerrilla Girls critiqued the arts, so they did kind of the opposite. They kind of dug down and they're like, hey, you're not like, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And so they kind of, they used the arts in different ways, but also I found it really interesting how the Guerrilla Girls kind of wanted to keep their identity unknown, and even if they told anyone, like, those people never told anyone either, which also kind of blew my mind. Like, they built that much, like, trust with people that they wouldn't even expose their identities, so. Yeah. Next question. Comment or constructive critique. <laughs> I appreciated the historical perspective and examples, uh, but who's performing today that you think we should be paying attention to? Ooh, that's a tricky one. Um, performing today, like performing social justice, or like in the music, or just like anyone who's kind of out there. Uh, someone who's performing social justice that's starting to make it into more mainstream media and more outlets. Hmm. I'll have to be honest, I don't know a ton of names of people in social justice, but for some reason the first name that pops in my mind, though I feel like I'm going to mess up her last name. That's the girl who played Hermione in Harry Potter, Emma S mm. Watson. Watson. Yeah, Watson. I'm really bad at names. Like, I don't know, I just think about how she has her platform of acting, but I've seen so many videos of her talking about, like, real-world issues, and I feel like those are the type of people I aspire to be. Like, you can gain your platform with acting or arts, and you can use it as well to spread your message, but also if you just use that platform and instead of, like, talking like about your life and maybe like what you did on Sunday, you kind of use it to talk about these bigger issues because I feel like, at least for me, that's not something I see a lot in the media and I feel like we should see that a lot more. Mom has a question. <laughs> or a comment or a constructive critique. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Let's see, I'm actually really so I recently wrote about, in a book chapter, when I was asked to sort of review my life as a feminist in um, music education, um, to look back at the beginnings of the fem feminist movement. And um, what it was about. It was as bad as you can imagine. And, um, and as I was telling Annabelle about this, she would be giggling about it. Because there's something she finds really old and irrelevant about feminism. And so I wonder if you might tell me or address that today. Like, for you, what does modern feminism look like? Or does, is feminism a term that's completely out of style now? So, <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, being, I wasn't expecting to be accused of not liking feminism here. Um, but, so, I don't know. I feel like the part that when I'm looking at feminism, like when I was doing my IHR, I know I said to you, you know, I feel like I've had so much feminism around me, I want to go into queer theory or something new. I think it's just because I have been surrounded by it since I was a little kid. I mean, I was in your talk shows when I was like nine years old about women empowerment, you know? And um, I've just been surrounded by it a lot, and sometimes it just seems like the same repetitive story. And so, like, it seems, that sounds kind of weird to say, but it's like, you're upset about something, so you started this movement, but yet it still falls off, you know, and it doesn't always seem to have, like, success always at the end of the story. And I was also curious as to see maybe how this was in different social justice issues outside of feminism, and kind of to compare those as well. Yes, mother. I should have just left it. This is going to be back and forth. First of all, I think my daughter's brilliant, and I really appreciate the, the insights that she brings to, to me and, and to my life. So I'm wondering, with the, um, so one of the things I worry about is that old school canceled feminist is that um, you, um, your generation has opened up the category of woman where many um, you know, female bodied people don't claim to be female anymore. So instead of the ma male female binary it does not exist in the same way in your generation as it does as it did in mine. So I wonder how do you see the world progressing towards equality when there's so many more flavors now? Like we didn't get it done for women, how will you get it done for everybody? Well, 
I feel like now that it's actually more opened up and more broad, like I know you might think it's easier to follow when you have that strict definition of this is a woman, but even as you were talking to me about feminism, even that in itself started spreading out to feminism for white women, feminism for women of color, feminism for women of a higher class or of a lower class, and so that was already spreading out into its own categories, and so I feel like with the fact that we're kind of broadening the spectrum even more, even though there might be more issues to deal with, you're still going to be able to find that middle ground of like, everyone just wants to feel equal, you know, you don't want to feel discriminated against, against something you can't control, you know, whether that's your female body or you identify as female, you know, so I think if anything, it might even be easier because it'll help us gain an even better understanding or it might even simplify it even though it seems like it might complicate it to have all these different identities because you have transgender women and cisgendered women and then you have people who are non-binary and all of that but it might almost simplify it because we have all of these views and if we come to understand with all of that then in itself it'll kind of slowly manifest this like coming together that I think feminists have been hoping for since the beginning. Or a question? Comment. I I would just love to be a fly in your home. And just listen to your mother. There is something beautifully attractive about a woman with an open mind, with a broad perspective like yours. It's you will go places. That's evidence. Totally. Congratulations on a wonderful presentation. Tell us a little bit more about this, about Nora. What is it you have learned in, you know, as you got in contact with Nora, what is it the one thing that maybe surprised you from her journey or something? Give us something about her. I think the main thing I was surprised by is the first time I meet her, this woman is the happiest woman in the entire world. Which, I would not expect from someone who survived the Rwandan genocide. I mean, she was supposed to be killed in a church that they burned down, and then she was lined up to be killed by her neighbor, and yet she's still here today. And she's like peppier than I am, which I think is saying a lot. I can, I can be quite energetic sometimes. And so I think that's the main thing I've learned from her is like, it doesn't matter what's happened to you in the past. All that matters is your attitude about the present. And like, if you want to change something, don't be like, oh, I feel so sad that this is all happening. Like, change that and be positive and turn it into that, use that positive energy to make the change you want to see instead of just sulking in the past. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Questions, comments, constructive criticism? Okay, uh, I, I just want to say one thing, one last thing is uh, I am actually pretty excited to see Annabelle where you go in the next 10 years. Um, you talk a lot about, I mean, I, I remember you from fifth grade, and, and so I remember little little Annabelle, remember when I was Miss Potter that time? Um, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and see, yeah, so seeing you, seeing you guys grow up the way that you have, and seeing you present this, um, I know that you think that, that feminism is kind of old hat, and you've seen it your whole life, but not everybody has that perspective, and so, I combine that with the your your study of these movements that were kind of de rigueur at the time and kind of fell flat for various reasons, right? I want to see how you've learned lessons from that and keep whatever movement that you find yourself a part of in the next five or ten years going and make it more successful than the ones that, that you study. So that's my that's my comment about, about you. Excellent job. So let's give Annabelle one final moment.